Namato Ratana Tayasa May I pay homage to Triple Zem, the Buddha and Dhamma and the Sangha. My respect goes to my parents and to my teachers. Hello everyone. Today is Wednesday the 10th, June 2020. This is Ajahn Sujan from Warapunya Meditation Centre, Aberdeen, Scotland. As usual, I am here with you all. Those who are locally listening to me and also internationally from different parts of the world. So hi everyone. Hi Colin, Chameli, Manoz. Karina, Margaret, Manish, and everyone. So, apologies that if I do not call your names. I was uh, given, a, 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 a sen I got the text saying that, why you didn't call my name? <laughs> so sometimes I do not see all the names and uh, so apologies that if I do not call your names as I speak. Okay. <laughs> so hi everyone. So, so just uh, do not be offended that I do not call your names. Okay. And I do hope uh, that although I do not uh, know hi to you all from different parts of the world. Uh, you continue will listen uh, the talks the knowledge is more important and, and what is being said and uh, take it into practice uh, rather than waiting oh why Ajahn Sujan do not call my name uh? <laughs> so hi Anju uh, Sukiyos yeah. <laughs> So, and again, uh, so many people that I do not know and I don't have uh, any conversation yet. Uh, and uh, on a Facebook, although the number of viewers says that about 14, 15 people, the names appears only a couple of them and uh, maybe due to the uh, internet or due to this slow internet that I have here at the center. But anyway, so my thoughts are with you and uh, although I do not call your names and say hi to you, my hi to you all. Okay? <laughs> so, <clears throat> and thank you everyone for following and listening to me. And I hope that uh, listening these talks have... Uh, given you uh, insight into the Buddha's teachings and how to use the Buddha's teachings in daily life and how to uh, understand. Uh, even the Buddha said that uh, listening the talks are uh, the, the different benefits of it. Uh, one of them is things that we never heard we will be hearing and things that we have heard will become more clear yeah will become more clear and some will listen out of a faith and someone listen to increase the knowledge and someone listen just for the merits and someone listen for the guidelines and they will practice in their pro in their daily life and will get more benefit from listening the talks okay so do not take as a, a offense if i do not uh, and uh, say hello to you but my I am I will be here uh, in, in case if you uh, send a text or a message then I will definitely say hello although sometimes it may be a little late uh, and particularly the questions if you have asked the questions then I definitely will answer your uh, questions yeah so there are three particular questions I was asked. Number one, how do we know? So on the, on the basis of these three questions, I will explain or will cover this tonight. 
So number one, the question was asked that how do we know the difference between mind and a matter? And now, in order to understand this mind and a matter, you know, first we have to practice meditation. In an intellectual level, we may see it that this is mind and this is a matter. But in an experiential level, in order to understand that experiential level of understanding, we have to practice and only then we will realize in its true self of this you know, mind and matter. Now, in general, okay, in general, to understand this mind and a matter, the first thing is the things or the object that you have observed is a matter and the mind that is observing is the mind yeah so it's called a nama and a rupa in buddhism so a rupa which hasn't got any sense of understanding or any sense of a feeling or experience so like this body this body doesn't feel we may perceive it that this body feels, but in fact, this body doesn't feel. If this body feels, what about a dead body? Dead body doesn't feel. So, we as a person who is still alive feel or have this perception that this body feels. In fact, whenever something, movement or some activity takes place at that moment, our, our consciousness goes at that place, or our neurons will go and perceive it, and that's how we perceive it, that, okay? So this whole body. And a second is a rup, uh, sorry, nama, yeah? So nama here, according to the Buddhism, is divided into four parts. One is called feeling or experience. Okay. And then the memories that we have or perceptions that we have. And then the, the uh, formation, the nature of a formation or karma formation, uh, converting into this and a that or the quality of uh, identification, you know, identifying, defining and those. And then go on with that, this is that, this is this, this shape of like this, this shape of like that so on and then the last one is called the consciousness okay. so these four combined is called nama and in a practice of insight and meditation is to understand these two parts of the nama and rupa rupa we work with rupa to begin with so called kaya nupassana so bodily contemplation yeah. we contemplate on the body we may contemplate on the breath or abdomen rising falling that is a part of the bodily contemplation also known as body in the body yeah so one breath is regarded as a body in the bigger body yeah so like that <clears throat> And even the rising falling, this is also one part of the body in the body, so called body in the body. Okay, so this is the, the body part, we begin with that, and later with that, we gradually develop into understanding of you know, sensations, feelings, perceptions, you know, and how this forms in identification and understanding. So later on, we will be able to define these two, Nama and Rupa. So this will be the first insight knowledge known as Nama Rupa Paricheta Yana. So the practice of insight meditation, although we start off with contemplation, contemplating on the breath or the abdomen or any objects, and then gradually we develop and understanding this feelings, sensations, perceptions, and consciousness, and so and so. And later we will be able to define what is matter and what is a mind. That's called nama and rupa. So in a brief, the object that you are observing is matter 
and the mind that is observing is the mind right and simply there is another practice norm normally you may have heard if you are practicing it's called observing so observer the observe observed and observed observer and observed like that okay so that is mind and a matter so as you progress in your practice uh, you gradually will be able to understand that mind and a matter and that's the first knowledge that you will understand and there in a vipassana meditation inside meditation you know uh, do not be frightened to know that there are 16 stages of insight meditation insight knowledge okay? and the first knowledge is ability to differentiate between what is mind and what is a matter okay so that is uh, the the answer for that question of what is the mind and the matter in a short form and the second question is about the uh, Dr. Ambedkar which I have been uh, referring in a, in a couple of nights uh, uh, talks that uh, uh, Dr. Ambedkar uh, one of the uh, greatest uh, revolutionists and socialist in India uh, uh, I was referring in relation to the racial issue that we have been facing this at that at this moment which started from America and then how the racism is getting you know, bigger and bigger in you know in, in even, even in the UK uh, which supposed to be you know suppose uh, which happened in America but again it spread in the UK as well although my view that racism is there and it is not good and very bad but i would say that this is not the right time for go out and you know and having this mass protest uh, because we are facing this invisible war with this coronavirus we should have you know find other alternative ways to deal with it and and uh, you know a protest in different forms and different ways but anyway, in relation to that racism, I brought up and a talk and a refer to the Dr. Ambedkar a couple of time and a couple of his uh, quotations and his philosophies. So I was asked to give a short biography of the, uh, the Dr. Ambedkar. So Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar, or he's known as a Bhim Rao Ambedkar, he was. Uh, born in very low caste in india and uh, his father was uh, quite wise enough to encourage him to go and study and get the more education but however due to the caste systems and he was born in a very low caste uh, he was not allowed to study going to schools or even you know sitting in the same uh, room or even having a problem with the writing on a blackboard and eating times and those things but he was very talented he spent a lot of time reading uh, books and his father and mother also encouraged him to study more and more but he was you know continuously bullied and uh, continuously you know harassed and punished being born as a low caste by the so-called higher castes continue and you know, punished him and this is not just in those days but even nowadays is still happening and it's sad to know which happened uh, you know recently even in nepal you know and the higher so-called higher castes killed around six people six boys simply because of the uh, this so-called high, high caste born lady uh, ha, you know, having a, a relationship with this low caste uh, boy and somehow they killed you know around six uh, boys and which caused a lot of uh, protest uh, this in Nepal uh, and this is even in, in in India as well every day we will hear this punishment and bullies and torture and things 
but the government also kept silent you know so the same thing happened to the doctor Ambedkar you know um, and then he was fortunate that he was very talented and he was onto the education and study and fortunately later one of the uh, high caste uh, teacher having seen his capability given him the new surname so called Ambedkar so Ambedkar is basically the high caste uh, surname after having this high caste surname he had more access uh, to the education and that's how he gradually you know gained more education and even got a scholarship from that time was uh, Baroda uh, government and the English uh, colonial time uh, in India so this uh, general he uh, gave him a sponsorship to go to study in Harvard University in America and while he was studying there he also wanted to learn the uh, economics so he came to London to study economics and then later the, while he was doing economics uh, so he studied law, uh, law uh, in, in, uh, in America and then while he was studying economics in London schools of economics he also studied Sanskrit language simply to understand that why Hinduism is dividing this caste system and causing this a lot of uh, uh, difficulties for the lower caste and that time when he was in America when he was sorry he was when he was studying in America at that time he noticed uh, the black rising uh, the, during the time of uh, uh, Martin Luther King so he said that uh, compared to the caste system in India the uh, black community are still greater you know they have more opportunities they are paid well and they have a right uh, to go to schools and a right you know so uh, much much better than lower caste in India so he uh, fought you know for the freedom for this lower caste in India and that's how he came to London and studied Hinduism sorry, uh, Sanskrit Sanskrit language to understand the Hindu scripture but unfortunately he runs out of the uh, scholarship and he had to went back and he had to go back to India to serve uh, to pay back his uh, scholarship and it happened that despite of he was you know, uh, educated in the West and uh, got a doctor degree and a well educated man uh, suited booted with a uh, great knowledge of uh, you know the whole about the laws and the politics and economics and the scriptures when he went as a senior officer in one of the offices in Baroda to pay back his scholarship the carpet was taken away and he was not offered you know like when some uh, someone comes to give uh, files rather than handing over is thrown onto his table and he couldn't find the place to stay uh, yeah, and when he finally even he had a chance he had a, a place uh, but it was very difficult and later on because of that difficulties he couldn't stay in that city and that's how he gradually developed uh, a group and a fight so he fought for the freedom as a lawyer and a free service to the low castes and that's how he gradually entered into the uh, politics and as he developed this political uh, career uh, and uh, he was also one of the round table uh, member of a round table discussion for the independent of India along with the Mahatma Gandhi yeah, Mahatma Gandhi and he oh, and Nehru and these these were the key figures t for the uh, independent and uh, later once the uh, India got independent you know he became the first law minister 
who again was the chairperson to draft the Indian constitution. Uh, he was the first minister and the first law minister and also chaired uh, the uh, this uh, Indian constitution and later it is found that the rest of other members again didn't join with him so he had to draft himself almost all the law the constitution of Indian constitution and he had to defend in the parliament and that's how this constitution established and I think Indian constitution ever since never been changed apart from adding little bit more onto it whereas compared to other countries you know every few few years constitution are changing according to it suits to that particular party rather than they're putting the country as a first whereas Dr. Ambedkar put the country and the people as the and her first and that's how the constitution becomes so strong and so established the one very important point here we have to uh, see that he was born as a Hindu but having seen this Hindu suppression and uh, and, uh, and suppression to the people and you know, different caste system and torture in about 1936 he announced in a public that I was born as a Hindu but will not die as a Hindu and that sparked so many other faith groups to in you know, to, to invite him to be part of their faith yeah, and even the Christianity, Sikhism, you know, Farsis, they try to convince Dr. Ambedkar to convert into their religion. But he already you know, had in his mind, and he was studying Buddhism, and he was writing the books on Buddhism already. So, but it took him almost 20 years to officially convert into Buddhism. So in 1956, if I'm not wrong, he announced that he is going to you know, uh, follow Buddhism officially along with you know, millions of uh, untouchable people, he converted into Buddhism. But sadly, within a few months later, he passed away. But his mission continued and have, you know, people from uh, this untouchable, uh, particularly in untouchable uh, people from India, continued his mission. The mission is educate, agitate and organized. And this has become a worldwide organization. I had a privilege to work with this group uh, when I came to UK for the first time in 2005, 6 and 7. And occasionally I again engage with uh, this group so I have uh, 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 so-called first-hand experience working with them so that's that's the, uh, the uh, bit of a, a background about um, the Ambedkar you know, in short and if you want to read or if you want to search about him you will find plenty and probably he is the first person that who has written so many books uh, in English mostly obviously uh, maybe uh, after Nehru or maybe more than Nehru that he has written he had written that many books on different subjects so this is a short uh, uh, introduction to uh, Dr. Ambedkar that I was referring uh, and uh, if you want to know and uh, how much he had done uh, for the untouchables in India and uh, you will be amazed to know that uh, and um, there are plenty you know of organizations still working on that uh, although he you know encouraged his followers to believe in Buddha and you know uh, uh, embrace Buddhism that doesn't mean that there are not other uh, groups that are following other religion uh, Christian uh, followers, but you know, following the Buddha uh, the Ambedkar's uh, philosophy There are Sikhs as well, you know, and they're combining with that one. The only difficult is 
although the, the Ambedkar said that they should organize, but it seems hardly they are organized together. There are more of a, like a power struggle going on rather than complete organizing. So, but the good thing that he also, uh, Ambedkar also said that if you can't take it forward, maintain what has been done. So I believe they have been trying to maintain at least in that state of his mission. So this is Ambedkar uh, history uh, and his work to the Indian community. And the third question I was asked is about how to practice Anapanasati. Now, practice of Anapanasati, uh, it's been very famous uh, and everyone practice the Anapanasati and everyone will talk about Anapanasati. And um, we have a famous uh, tradition or the group so-called uh, 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 following, following the uh, the Vipassana Acharya, the Achan Goenka, uh, Acharya Goenka, who also uh, born and learn, born in Burma, Myanmar, current Myanmar, uh, Indian Indian lineage, uh, born in Myanmar and uh, studied meditation in in in, in Myanmar from Ubakin and he went to India and spread the uh, so-called Anapanasati in in the new form. Uh, and meanwhile, there are other techniques like uh, uh, we have uh, this uh, Buddha Dasa Bhikkhu in Thailand introduced the Anapanasati and Achan Cha or Achan Man in Thailand also introduced in accordance with the uh, Anapanasati. But each different you know, traditions follow differently. Uh, but what we have to understand that when we look at uh, the uh, teachings, the Anapanasati itself, yeah, uh, there's two things we have to understand. One, it is not about the pranayama or the playing with the breath or breathing exercise. Okay, it's not the pranayama. But the breath is simply is just a tool to train the mind. So that's the one. You know, the one thing is not the pranayama, and the second is it's a tool to train our mind. So that's the second thing that we have to understand. And in a practice of Anapanasati, there are 16 stages and that comes under the four foundations of a mindfulness. And in order to understand this uh, practice of Anapanasati, we have to, you know, if we refer to the suttas, the, what the Buddha said, we can refer to the Rahula Vada Sutta that the Buddha had introduced to the Rahula. Yeah? And this, I think, we don't have a time to go on to this uh, detail of uh, how to practice Anapanasati. But a simple, uh, simple technique is as breathing in and breathing out, you're aware of a breathing in and breathing out. Or you're breathing in, you know that you're breathing in, breathing out, you know that you are breathing out. And, uh, and along with that, the breath is continuously with it, but you will be experiencing and investigating so-called yoni somanasikara, skillfully investigating each and every stages up to the uh, 16 stages, and that's the, the last stage, so-called vimutti, uh -huh. and that is the last stage that we can uh, practice. But uh, Buddha also said that once we have completed these all 16 stages then that means we have completed the four foundations of mindfulness once we have fulfilled the four foundations of mindfulness uh, then that leads to so-called uh, uh, bojangas yeah? uh, enlightening factors and that's how we uh, which are and vimuti and liberation will attain so i end here for tonight uh, and thank you all three questions and I hope that I have covered and uh, satisfied you with these answers. And, uh, any questions if you have, you can uh, again post. So I will try to cover on those uh, topics uh, further in the next days. Okay, so I end here and in a few minutes time we will have uh, evening chanting and guided meditation. You are most welcome to join and if you are not joining for tonight, then good night. If you're joining, we'll see you shortly.
with this may you be happy peaceful may the buddha bless you for your good health and successful stay safe and take care and good night